Right, so I can very vividly remember my first day working at Hotels.com. And my manager, he sits me down, and he explains what problem we're going to try and solve. And he starts off by explaining the concept of meta search. And the idea is that someone can go to a website like TripAdvisor, punch in where they want to go, how long they want to be there, and they'll compare a number of different options from different travel agencies. So as I was preparing for PyData today, I punch this in, and I get back these two properties. Now, the resolution here is awful, but you might be able to see that there's different travel agencies within uh, a property. And the ordering of those travel agents is, at least in part, determined by how much they're willing to pay for the privilege. So the fact that Expedia is number one here suggests that they were willing to pay TripAdvisor more than we were. And on the flip side, at the Vintry and Mercer, where we're in number one, that suggests that we were willing to bid more in this mini auction. And our problem was that we were going to try and work out the expected value of a click on every property, with a view to automatically sending this to TripAdvisor. Now, at this point, I have a realization. And I realized in my career so far, university, my jobs, I've never actually made a model that's done anything. So. I filled out Excel sheets, I put like columns in databases, and I've made recommendations, but there's always been a human in the loop, looking over the model's shoulder, making sure that what it's doing is reasonable. And the idea of this safety blanket being taken away, terrifying. I can feel my hands start to climb up, a little bit like at the moment, actually. <laughs> but my manager, you see, he wasn't done. He explained this is an incredibly complex problem. The way that people want to travel varies a lot through time, through location, and from person to person. And if that weren't enough, it's also just a very important problem. TripAdvisor and similar sites are a big source of revenue and um, profit for Expedia. Uh, and at this point, my clammy hands have progressed into full-on flop sweat. My hands are shaking. I can feel like my gut being wrenched. And to top it all off, he explains that mistakes in this space are super expensive. If we submit a wrong set of bids and we overpredict, then we can lose finance redactedly huge sums of money before we're able to correct it. And honestly, I was you know, contemplating just walking away at this point. I felt so stressed. And it truly was a very stressful journey to getting to a successful model. Along the way, I made a number of really high impact uh, mistakes. And my hope is that today you'll be able to learn from those mistakes and avoid them in your own work. So everything I'm going to say is colored by my context. But it should apply to your work if your models fit into like these kind of three different things. Uh, whether your model should have to carry out some important task. Now, that might be spending millions of dollars of advertising spend. Or it might be powering some feature on your website that's very important to your customers. Secondly, you'd expect these models to be hard to understand. They should be modeling a complex domain, or they should operate at some scale which is just superhuman. So I think even a very simple model at Twitter is going to be very complex for a human to understand. And finally, these models will operate semi-autonomously, either due to the scale or the way you have to deploy. You can't have a person step in. You can't have the a person looking at their predictions and then saying, no, don't do that. So we have to be able to trust that they're willing to do the right thing in a wide range of different situations. So to sum up, and this will be super important throughout the rest of the talk, we need these models to be powerful enough to do that which we wish them to do, but we need them to be reliable enough that my blood pressure can stay under 200 over 90. Not there yet. <laughs> so I leave this meeting, and I'm sat down in front of my computer, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I've never solved this, this problem before. <laughs> but I'm not so green behind the ears, so I don't know how to do data science. So I'm just going to stick to what I know, and I'll be fine. Uh, so I'm going to take what I've called here the fairy tale approach to data science. I'm going to go off. I'm going to get some interesting data. I'm going to want to talk to TripAdvisor, to our bookings team. I'm going to want to talk to our lodgings team to find as much about these properties as possible. I'm going to mash it all together do some cross-validation, so k-fold, time series, these kind of things. I'm going to choose some error metric, like RMSC over revenue per click. And then finally, just do a whole series of cool things, like stuff you might have heard up today. I'm going to try cat boost, try some feature engineering, try some parameter optimization. 
Now, I've called this the fairy tale approach to data science, not because I wish to be critical. It actually has a very strong central message. And I'd hope that you're all doing something that looks kind of sort of like this. And in the same way, fairy tales give us a very strong ethical message. They give us a clear idea of what it means to act right and to be a good person. But if you try to live your entire life by fairy tale ethics, you'd find that super limiting. As you enter complex, adult, nuanced situations, you need a complex, adult, nuanced approach to data science, to ethics, <laughs> but also data science. And if we set off with good intentions and a simple approach, we'll quickly run into failures. And I'm going to talk about these four main categories today. They were by no means my only failures, but they're just the ones which look the best on the slides, really. So I'm going to talk about looking at a single error metric, failing to account for all goals, building a model I couldn't talk to, and interacting poorly with humans. So I set off, it seems like a phenomenal idea to choose RMSC over revenue per click and optimize that as much as I humanly can. And it was really nice to begin with. If I wanted to try out a new modeling approach, new features, new parameters, I just like scoop them all up, I chuck them into cross-validation, and I just choose the one that ends up looking the best. And at this stage, I'm feeling pretty cocky, feeling pretty good about life. My RMSC is looking healthy and beating the models that already exist. And then we try launching it. And the performance is absolutely, shockingly, catastrophically poor. It's like we're losing money hand over fist in one place, and then we try it again, and we're getting no volume somewhere else. I'm thinking to myself, what, what's gone wrong? So I go back, and I look at my models. And I see that, yes, my RMSC was getting better through time. But I was doing a lot of damage to other metrics. So my MAE was getting worse. I was getting quite weird shapes of um, error distributions. And I was having a lot of overall bias. On the worst day, the worst day of it all, I discovered that a model that predicted zero profit for a click on any property was actually getting a better RMSC than my champion model. <coughs> I'm like, it's an awful model, right? But just because of how RMSC works out, it looked better. And if this weren't enough, the models weren't just not accurate. They were also shockingly unreliable. So I have here on screen uh, a plot of predictions from different cross-validation sets. So this is one train set that I could up in a number of different ways. And you can see that the models ended up with predictions that just look wildly different. They're different in terms of central tendency. They're different in terms of variance. They're different in terms of shape. So this is just a nightmare to validate. If I run my model again and I get a totally different result, how do I know if that's just natural or like the model doing its thing, or if that's a problem that's been introduced? And I probably could have lived with this if the models had proved themselves trustworthy. But the slightest amount of bad data, or sometimes just like you look at the model wrong and it would explode. And for no reason, you'd be losing money quite quickly. And that was just an incredibly stressful experience. I hasten to point out, all of these graphs are fake data for illustrative purposes. So what's the solution? Uh, the solution is to realize that RMSE, or whatever error metric you want to use, is only ever going to be an approximation to that which you care about. And like all good approximations, it has its use cases. Um, but if you try and stretch it too far, you'll end up um, at edge cases, damaging yourself. The solution that we came up with was to have a standard set of diagnostics that captures everything that we care about in model performance. So things like stability, distribution of errors, overall bias. Uh, for us, this was a Jupyter notebook that you could just hit, and it would generate all these graphs, but whatever stack you want. In the best of all possible worlds, these notebooks would not only have what's important, but also guide you into what does good look like? Like, what's a reasonable level of stability? And if you want to be proper North Star about it, they'd give you a way to make decisions. So you'd have maybe red, amber, green on every one of these metrics. It's like red, 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 really. But um, A good set of diagnostics should be simple to run, easy to save for reference, and simple to just share and comment. It's incredibly liberating when you've tried out a new set of things, to just get an output, get it in Dropbox, send it to your team, and then get feedback on it in a way that everyone already understands. 
And if you take nothing else from this talk today, I'd recommend it to be this. Just make some diagnostic notebooks. Even if they're very simple, they'll be very useful for you. <laughs> However, it's important to remember that the purpose of this is not to get a stack ranking of models. By their very nature, by their very purpose, the goal is to be forced into making explicit trade-offs. You're never going to make a model that's better at everything. You're going to have to trade off accuracy for bias, bias for stability, these kind of complex decisions. And there is no best way to make these. Uh, like the best trade-off is going to vary between companies, between industries, between teams. And to give you an example, we start off as quite a small team with a lot to do. Sorry. So it made sense for us to trade off accuracy for stability so that we could get the maximum bang for buck. But now as we're growing as a team, and we're still hiring, uh, it makes sense to try and maybe reduce some of that stability and um, juice up the metrics a bit. Trade a bit of stability for a bit more performance and see if we can get better results. One of the big questions around diagnostics is what should you include? Uh, there's an obvious trade-off here between speed and depth. The more you add, the slower it gets, the less likely your data scientists are to run the diagnostics. A good algorithm that we found is to start with a kitchen sink approach. Just chuck everything that you might think is even conceivably useful in there. And then through time, you'll just naturally trim out stuff that you don't use. Once you've run this four or five times, you'll find there's like three core graphs that you look at every time. And the rest is just rubbish. You just get rid of it. And then on the spin side, every time you see a problem with models in production that you didn't expect, you go back and you try and find something that would have alerted you to that in advance. And you put that in your diagnostics. And that saved me more time than I can count in this process. So that was phase one. Um, I go back to the basics. I maybe make a few different trade-offs. And now I have a stable model. It's not as accurate, but it performs much better. And I'm feeling like king of the world at this point. I truly am. In a few months, I've come in, I've revolutionized it, and then the revenue that we're making from MetaSearch is way up. Seriously, like giant head time. <laughs> but then, like, a few weeks later, I'm in a meeting with someone from finance. And they look at me and they say, isn't it awful? Isn't it awful that the uh, click share on TripAdvisor is way down? And I look at him and I go, but... But yeah, but revenue's way up. And he looks at me and he's like, yeah, but click share's way down. And we stare at each other in mutual bafflement for about five minutes. And then a few days later, I'm talking to someone who's in charge of, say, um, the American destination, trying to get people to go to America. And he looks at me and he's like, oh, isn't it awful that revenue to America's way down? And I look at him and I'm like, yeah, but revenue overall's way up. And he looks at me and he's like, yeah, but revenue to America's way down. And we stare at each other in mutual bafflement for five minutes. And after a few weeks of this, it starts to sink through that actually maximizing revenue from meta search, what I thought was my goal, actually wasn't enough for this model not to be a failure. The reality is that there was a whole host of possible side objectives that people around the company could have had. So I have here on the screen the like, things that I thought about at the top of my head. Sending people to America, sending people from America, getting new properties to sign up, getting new people to join Hotels.com. Now, what's really interesting about these is that they're not just purely random side goals. They actually uh, work against the main goal. If I was aiming to just maximize revenue per search, I wouldn't give a damn about getting new customers into the business, right? I'm going to want my core customers going to my core properties, and that's how I'm going to make the most revenue. But actually, I have all these side constraints that place limitations on how I can go about them. And not being aware of them caused me to fail quite horrendously. And the most galling part of the whole thing was that failure existed in that very first meeting with my manager. As soon as I stepped out of that, even before I started typing, I'd failed. I should have said, look, no. I get that this is a simple way that you're explaining it to a new joiner. But there's actually a much richer context here. And then I'm going to go around, and I'm going to talk to a wide variety of different stakeholders, build their trust, understand what's important to them. And by this, you don't have to be best of friends with your stakeholders. You just have to know them well enough that you know what's important to them, and you know why it's important. 
And they have to know you well enough that they can trust that you can do that. Now, once you've got all of this information, it's important to make trade-offs. Like, you can't make everyone happy with this model. Um, just like sometimes it's impossible. You have to decide what is and isn't important. And that's probably going to be a factor of who's asking, how valuable it is to the business, and honestly, just can you do it? And you separate this out into maybe four or five goals that you're going to achieve, and you explain clearly in a language that people understand why you're not going to be able to achieve their side goals. And maybe you tell them that in the future you'll try and get to them, but like you just have an understanding with them that even though you think that it's important, you can't do it right now. And that will prevent so many stones being thrown at you in the future. Lastly, it isn't enough to simply be aware these things exist. You also need to make sure you're going to do something about them, right? If we just set off uh, saying nice platitudes, we're not going to get anywhere. For us, I found the most effective way was to add these things to our diagnostics notebooks. So each one of the side goals would have two or three charts to see how well we're doing on each different section. So you might have overall accuracy, accuracy on new properties, accuracy on old properties, that kind of thing. Quite similar to the um, presentation earlier on today about the preventing bias in machine learning. Making sure that each of these segments is well represented in your model. Hmm. So, go back to basics, start all again, another three months of my life gone. And I set about remaking this model, and this time we have great success. So I now know what I'm doing, I've got a decent foundation, and I've got a good model, we're making money hand over fist, and I'm feeling great this time. Giant head. And this feeling actually does last for a few weeks. All is looking very healthy. But then frustration starts to grow. Because I realize that it's very difficult for me to be talking to these models. What do I mean by that? So I have here on screen the Ventry and Mercer from earlier. It's a real screenshot from our website. Now, if I'm going to start talking about revenue per click, I don't have much of an intuition for what that means. As someone who travels a lot, who works in the travel industry, who actually works on this problem, I don't really have a feel for where this property should be on a revenue per click basis. I mean, it's got quite a high price per night, looks very nice, has great reviews, but like, how to aggregate that. And this starts off a little frustrating, but then through time I realize I also can't talk to my model analytically. So I have here on the right, uh, I'm purely illustrative, distribution of revenue per click that we might observe through properties. And most of the time, someone's going to click on a property and not convert, so they'll be in this big spike at zero. And then occasionally, someone will come on and they'll convert, and then they'll be way down this slab. Now, as you might imagine, this is a difficult distribution to work with. It's going to take a long time before the central limit theorem kicks in for this. And across the next few months, we experience severe problems on both um, accuracy and stability. So the first real issues that we were having was that it's very difficult to diagnose the model. How do you build a hypothesis for what the model's doing badly if you don't have an intu intuition for the domain and you don't have good analytical tools? And unlike the fluke shot that you hit upon something to improve the model with, how do you tell that you've made it better? You've got such a high baseline of error that it's just very difficult to see if you're making things better. And then as we were in meetings, like trying to discuss what the important new features to get into the model were, I realized I just had no idea. Like, I look at the Vintry and Mercer, and I'm like, what's an important feature for revenue per click? I don't know. I also just don't have any prior knowledge that I can bring about. If the model tells me that early breakfast is very important for revenue per click, I don't know how to. And then finally, um, it was very difficult to build trust in these models. So for the same reasons that it's hard to diagnose, it's, told to, it's difficult to know whether the model's doing well in production and whether I can identify whether something's gone wrong. And through time, this just became a drag. Like, we were having fewer model iterations, our test and learn was slower, and we were having to rely on like, full A-B tests more. And just through time, this means we didn't improve as much as we wanted to. So the solution was to go back to the problem and just to think about it a bit more, a bit more deeply. I might not have a good sense for revenue per click, but I probably have a pretty good feel for other things about this property. So if I look at this very high price per night, this 356, 
I can have a reasonable guess that if someone comes onto the property and converts, there's going to be a lot of revenue there, a lot of value created. So I have a sense about revenue per order. Likewise, I can guess some things about the conversion rate. So, for example, I know that expensive things are generally harder to sell. They generally have a lower conversion rate. Like, people just need a bit more reassurance. And also, people just like to click on expensive properties to see what expensive properties look like. So I expect it to have less than the average conversion rate, but it's probably not going to be too bad. Like, that's a fantastic set of reviews. It looks genuinely very pretty and is exactly where I want it to be. So I guess it's going to be around, like, the middle of the second quarter, somewhere in that territory. And by breaking um, revenue per click up into conversion rate and revenue per order, I can take something I knew nothing about and convert it into a factor, factorization of things I do know about. And we could continue this like almost indefinitely. We could take revenue per order and break it into number of nights and revenue per night. We could take um, number of room nights and break that into number of rooms and the number of nights and so on and so on. And from an engineering point of view, it makes sense to try and stay as high on this as possible. So like, you start off up here, and if you have compelling evidence that you're going to gain an advantage from breaking it down, you would do that. And we're probably now at the point where we're starting to build compelling evidence that we want to move down again. And as soon as you find the right factorization for your model, everything becomes so much easier. You can go from having this just gnarly mess of a distribution to a really nice kind of log normal gamma-ish and to a binomial kind of distribution. Um, so this is nicer just to look at, but it also means you have access to a lot of standard tooling. So most statistical packages will be able to do um, predictions of rates, classifications, and standard regressions, whereas they're not set up to deal with this kind of distribution. And this makes diagnosing models better and uh, monitoring the production much easier. But more than that, this new flood of domain knowledge uh, allowed our model progresses to just boom. We suddenly had loads of ideas, loads of hypotheses about how to make it better. And we also knew there were domain experts across the business that we could go and talk to if we ever ran out and needed more. So this was probably, I think, I think the best decision that we made in the whole process. Although not necessarily uh, applicable to your problems. So on to problem four. And at this point, you know what, I think we actually had solved it. Like, everything was looking pretty peachy at this point. Progression is happening quite nicely. And at a high level, it looked something like this. We'd have our data. Once a month, we'd retrain our models. We'd update all of our estimates. And then we'd have a lot of humans in the loop, domain experts with a lot of experience doing this, whose job was twofold. It was to take into account things that had happened since the last time that we trained the model. So say we enter a period of seasonality, conversion rate increases, we're going to need to push everything up. And the second was to try and um, correct things the model got wrong. So I mean, we try our best, we build good models, but occasionally they're not going to be right. And it's useful to have someone who has the expertise to push it up and do the little corrections. But now I'm looking at this. My ego is boosted by all the successes I've been having recently. Maybe we're at a bar, a bit of a drunken boast. I'm like, you know what, I can get rid of those humans in the loop. I'm a data scientist, right? They're going to follow some kind of broad algorithm. So I can codify it, I can replicate it, I can scale it, I can make it better. And I come up with this. So there's no need for people to be uh, responding to changes in distribution, right? Why train the model once a month when I can just train it once a day? Compute's cheap, you're just going to power it through. And there's still going to be some need for occasional corrections. The model's still not going to be perfect. So I'm going to have some kind of feedback loop, like a PID controller, which is going to do a lot of what the humans were doing before. But finally, I'm not quite so egotistical that I believe that I can get rid of the humans entirely, right? There's always going to be that edge case, that area where their domain expertise is going to allow them to be the model. So I'm still going to have them here, but like, they're only going to intervene in like, real special cases. And maybe already you can kind of start to see where this is going wrong. So we've got so many red lines coming down from the data deep into the process. And we've also taken one box and like shattered that into three different places. And indeed, this was catastrophic. And since then, we've completely like ditched this. It was a good like three months of development that was a waste of time. 
And the issue was that we now saw much lower levels of attention from our human operators. Whereas before, they were looking very deeply at everything every day. Like, there was just less need to do that now, right? So a data scientist comes to you, they say, look, I've got this model, this algorithm, it's going to do this great thing. You're just not going to check over a shoulder that much. The second is that we saw a lot of bad decisions on when to act. So this might either have been just showing the model too much respect, not stepping in when you should do, or on the spin, waiting too long and stepping in only when the model had corrected itself. So you had this wild oscillating swing of performance. And finally, just mechanically, the interventions were worse. We saw a lot more times where people wanted to do something, but because they hadn't done it in a while, they'd just forgotten how to do it, or they did it wrong, and that just led to problems and confusion. So it was really nasty, really bad. And the solution is to go back and to think about what made the original design work. So it might not be flashy, it might not be fancy, but it did have an incredibly clear handoff of responsibility. What was the job of the model versus what was the job of the human was very clearly demarked. And who had the final decision was never in doubt. The model updated once a month and then handed over to the human's total authority. But it was also a problem that was just very well suited to human operators. There's a very clear conceptual model. If I'm seeing that my return on investment is too high and that my volumes are too low, I push everything up. And if I see the reverse, I pull everything down. It's a simple model, and it's also one that it's um, very easy to get feedback on. Because I'm the only person acting in this system, if I push everything up by 5%, I see how much production I get the next day, I can then learn something about like, the elasticities and how the system responds. And then I can iteratively keep making decisions. The final nice thing is the consistent use, uh, to paraphrase Machiavelli, makes for great human operators. Being forced to use this every day develops a real sense of ownership and also just a great sense of expertise. So that when you do reach these occasions where extreme actions are needed, where your model is failing on edge cases, you've got people who are well-trained at the domain. By contrast, this approach is awful on every one of these. There is no clear handoff of authority. If I see that production is bad, is that the job of the daily model training? Is it the job of the feedback loop? Or is it my job as a human? And when do I, as a human, get the con? When can I make the decision against the machine? It's not, not at all clear. And there's also very little in the way of clear, timely feedback. Um, so if I push up by 5%, and then everything else in the system is doing different things, how do I disambiguate my, um, my actions from the actions of the overall system? And finally, people were just not being um, asked to do this very often. So when they came to do it, they didn't have that training. They were novices in the system being thrown in right at the deep end. Let's get that side. So the solution ultimately that I came up with could have looked like this, but this is still way too fancy. And I, I tried explaining it in my practice presentations, and I couldn't. And I have to admit that we ultimately just went back to this. Worked well. was a nice system. So those were the four main types of failures that I had along the way. If I could leave you with some parting thoughts, it's that the problems that we try to solve are difficult. It's easy to look at blog posts and videos and like courses online and think that data science is easy, that you can just take some data and throw it into an algorithm and get good results. But the reality is that following this fairy tale will lead you to failures. It's really important in our jobs, in our domain, that we think deeply about our models, why we're trying to build them, what we want them to do. Are they achieving those goals? And in what context are they operating? And this way, we can build successful models. Thank you. All right, so we have some time for questions. Uh, if we can put our hands up, then you can pick the people if you want. Gentlemen there. Um, to what extent, when you have an automatically trained model, are you just in an arms race against your competitors who also have automatically trained models, and you get some sort of feedback loop? Does that happen? Um, it does at times feel like trying to play football manager or something on those lines, <laughs> I have to admit. But I mean, the reality is that we're not actually competing against each other. Um, so there are customers who are just very well suited to Expedia, and there are customers which are very well suited to Hotels.com, and then there are customers who are very well suited to other people. 
And it's like through time, as these tools get more sophisticated, it's about finding for the right customer the right place to go. And we do spend a fair amount of time on that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Like in stock trading models, you run into that problem. Whereby yeah. you train your model and then it, it gets worse because it's yes. you change the market, that. basically. Yeah. But like there you have one homogenous commodity, whereas here we have lots of different people with different intentions, like different preferences. Anybody else? No? Oh, okay, cool. Uh, it's a very cool talk, thank you. Uh, how would you discuss it with like your higher level stakeholders to acknowledge failure to them? What do they think about it? Did you get promoted because of this success and failures or, or vice versa? So I think the main thing with dealing with stakeholders is like you build trust through a long period of time. So you can encounter these failures, but if they see you like on a Saturday morning owning up to making a mistake and making it right and fixing it, like that's a, a big thing. And like if they see that, it's kind of finally made mistakes, right? Everyone's gonna make mistakes, particularly in this very difficult domain. But there is this idea of data scientists as being feckless and disinterested and just wanting to do shiny things. And if you can show that you're not that, I think it's quite easy to build deep relationships with your stakeholders. Anybody else? Does that answer your question? Thank you. So I think the whole area of kind of model risk management and when do you want a human to step in and kind of override the decisions of the model is really interesting. There's obvious applications mm. in financial trading for one or kind of other industries. Um, did you and um, Hotels.com feel like there was a kind of body of knowledge you were looking at or were you kind of... Will you just kind of make it up as you go along? Sorry, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. But <laughs> no, no, we definitely do that as well. <laughs> um, so to start with, I was definitely making it so I went along. But because you, like, you're trying things and you're iterating and you're working closely with the human operators, you can see what works for you. I think a point of inflection that I had that led me to some of my biggest realizations was actually industrial process theory. So a lot of like nuclear plants studying where catastrophes happen in industrial plants. And like a lot of the themes that I had up on here were basically stolen from that kind of literature. But it's really fascinating stuff. Mm. Airplanes as well, like the disasters that they have and like the inspections into why that happened. We have time for one or two more. Anybody? So what I loved about this talk is, you know, people admit that sometimes stuff goes wrong and it doesn't happen well enough. And it would be kind of nice if maybe there were like resources and more stories like this. Would you happen to have maybe one or two? Like, I'm not sure if there's a book about this sort of thing, but maybe, you know, like a resource? That's an excellent question. One of the reasons I wanted to give this talk is because I wanted to have received this talk when I came to buy data two years ago. Um, I know that in academia there's this trend now to like a, an is that an CV or something like that, where you list the big failures you've got? I'm not aware of anything in the data science community in the same way, but no, sorry. I would love to see any of you find any on your way. Very quick question. All this process, what was the time scale of this? How long did it take from the beginning oh, to the end? Man. Just an embarrassingly huge amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> so from the first meeting, that was about two years ago. So like, the opening phase was quite fast, where I felt everything was going great, and then there was like a long one-year stretch where it was catastrophically awful. <laughs> like everything takes so much longer than you expect it to do. Anybody else? Okay, I have a question. Uh, out of all the four failures, which one had the biggest negative impact, would you say? That's a good question. It's like the worst failures you identify really quickly. So hyper-optimizing for RMSC, like you just see you've got a very bad model. I think this was the worst one, because it was very insidious, very long term. You built up this great set of um, people to work with, human experts, and like you're just slowly every week degrading their trust in you, but also like you're removing this well-trained aspect to them. And then suddenly you've got new people coming into the company and they've never had this good regime, and all they know is the bad regime. And that's really hard to reverse. Anybody else? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.